You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Leonardo da Vinci's painting of the Mona Lisa, also called La Gioconda, has captured society's collective imagination. Her hold on the audience is so intense, there's a widely known phenomenon called the Mona Lisa effect, referring to the experience of feeling like a subject of an image is looking directly at the viewer, no matter where one is standing in the room. Simply put, people feel like Mona Lisa is staring at them, and her eyes follow them around the room. According to scientists at Bielefeld University in Germany, La Giaconda does not look directly at the viewer. Her gaze is said to be about 15 degrees to the right, looking at the viewer's ear or over their shoulder. They concluded that, ironically, the Mona Lisa does not demonstrate the Mona Lisa effect. I feel like who art ed? Who art ed? Mr. Wood art ed me. <laughs> yeah. Either way, it, it's ambiguous. It works on so many levels. I know. Welcome to Who Arted, where we explore visual arts in an audio medium. As I said, technically, some scientists say that the Mona Lisa does not demonstrate the Mona Lisa effect because she's looking out at a slight angle. Still, there's a broad consensus that the Mona Lisa effect is a real phenomenon. So why do some paintings appear to be looking out with eyes that follow us around the room? For one, when we look at a face that's fixed in three dimensions, the light and shadows appear to shift as we move to look at it from different angles. In a two-dimensional image, however, the light and shadows do not shift as we move. Consequently, the face that's looking straight out from the picture appears to maintain the same relative position gazing out at us. I personally argue that the spotlight effect also has something to do with it. People have a tendency to overestimate how much others notice about them. People tend to think they are a larger focus of other people's attention, and perhaps on some level, this self-involvement leads us to believe that even pictures on the wall are watching and judging us. Of course, the eyes aren't the only odd and enigmatic feature on Mona Lisa's face. Most of my young students are quick to point out the unsettling appearance created by her lack of eyebrows, but it seems she may have originally had eyebrows and eyelashes. Those features appear to have been obliterated by old restoration efforts. The feature that really captivates so many, though, is the slightly coy smile. I think one of the most interesting bits is how minimally defined the smile appears to be. Leonardo was spending his days working in the studio and his nights examining cadavers to peel back the layers and understand the muscular structure behind facial expressions. His notebooks include many detailed anatomical drawings, and yet, in this painting, the smile is subtle and does not seem to engage the cheek muscles or the eyes. The expression actually seems different if you look at individual parts of her face. Researchers have found that people looking at the left half of her smile perceive it to be happy, while they do not detect joy in the right half. Similarly, the expression has been said to change depending on where you're focusing your attention, whether you're looking sort of at her eyes or at her mouth directly. The asymmetry of the smile has led researchers at the University of Cincinnati to say it was not a genuine smile. In other words, Mona Lisa was not truly happy, but forcing a smile for the sake of a good picture. Another contributing factor to the ambiguity and the shift in perception is the sfumato technique that Leonardo was using. Sfumato is basically smudging the edges. Uh, The soft edges of the shadows create some ambiguity that's perceived differently based on whether you're looking in your central or peripheral vision. When we focus on her eyes, the smile is in our peripheral vision, which tends to run the shadows from the mouth up into the cheeks and gives the sense of a bigger smile. As we look down and get the mouth into our sharper central field of vision, the smile seems to fade. While her stare and coy smile are known around the world today, the Mona Lisa was not always the most famous painting in the world. It appears to have been special to Leonardo. It's one of the few pieces he held onto until he passed away in 1519. 
He began the work around 1503, and some say he was even working on it, adding finishing touches as late as 1517. Still, while it appears to have been personally significant to Leonardo, some say because the portrait was actually a self-portrait of the Renaissance man in drag, I stick with the conventional wisdom saying that it was a commissioned portrait of another woman. Now, regardless of who the actual subject is, it is undeniably a great work of art, a fine painting, but it was long held as just one of many great Renaissance paintings in the Louvre's massive collection. A turning point came in the early 20th century. As I've covered in a previous episode, the Mona Lisa was stolen in 1911. Vincenzo Perugia basically just walked in through a side door of the museum. He took the painting off the wall, wrapped his coat around it, and walked out. The painting sat in his apartment for two years before he was caught trying to sell it to an Italian art gallery. Apparently, Perugia was under the mistaken impression that the Mona Lisa had been taken from Italy by Napoleon, because for a while, uh, Napoleon had the Mona Lisa hanging up in one of his palaces. He wanted it sort of repatriated back to Italy, and in, in that process, he got caught trying to sell it because the gallery owner did not want to be buying um, stolen artwork, and so he, he basically contacted the authorities. But during the two years where the work was missing, it captured headlines. The story became more sensational as famous figures like Pablo Picasso and the poet Apollinaire became suspects. After its return to the Louvre, the crowds became bigger and bigger. Today, the Mona Lisa sits in a climate-controlled box behind bulletproof glass, thanks to vandals who threw acid and then a rock at the work. Seeing it today means wading through a sea of people with cell phones raised, taking selfies in front of the most famous Renaissance masterpiece. But one final bit of intrigue lingering in the mythology surrounding the Mona Lisa is that some say all of those people visiting the museum today are crowding around and taking selfies in front of a forgery. It can be hard to believe that some massive world events like the theft of the Mona Lisa could be the result of some ordinary person just walking in and grabbing the painting off the wall. Conspiracy theories spring up to help give people a sense of order as big events appear to fit into a larger plan. On some level, it's comforting to think some greater villain or group of villains orchestrated a masterful heist. In 1932, the reporter Carl Decker found a more compelling villain for the piece. He wrote of a con man named Eduardo de Valfierno who claimed to have been the brains behind the theft of the Mona Lisa. He said he had Perugia steal the work so he could sell half a dozen forgeries to gullible and unscrupulous collectors. Along similar lines during World War II, there are spotty records with regard to the Mona Lisa's whereabouts during the time that many significant works were crated up from museums to protect them from Nazi plundering. There are two documents indicating that the Mona Lisa was among 12,000 works salvaged by the Monuments Men from a salt mine in Austria. The Louvre has said little about the painting's journey during World War II, but there are some indications that it may have been another version of the Mona Lisa used to send the Nazis on a wild goose chase, while the original was safely crated up somewhere else in France. Some see clever misdirection that helped preserve the most famous painting in the world, while others see another conspiracy of forgeries perhaps floating around to conceal the fact that the most famous painting in the world has been lost or stolen. The mysterious elements leave us all to see and believe what we want, making the experience of the piece unique to each individual. As with so many works of art, 
The greatness lies in the viewer's imagination. This concludes this week's episode of Who Arted, part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. If you found this tolerable, please leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. You can find images of the work being discussed this week and every week on social media at Who Arted Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And of course, on the website, whoartedpodcast.com. Podcast done.